What a cool project. And what a, I mean, I know you've been working on this for a long time, but uh, what a cool email to get that, hey, it's done. It's great. It's done. It's finally out after 37 years. You know, this is the book that I promised Pepper Adams on his deathbed. Wow. And I don't mean really? to smile. I mean, he, uh, I knew him in the last two years of his life. Yeah. Had the good fortune of meeting him in the summer of 1984 when he good. was still, uh, he didn't know that he was sick, but he looked right. pretty lousy at that time. Uh, it turns out that he had a broken leg. He actually ran himself over with his own car, which is not easy to right. do. I read that story. Yeah, I've, I've heard about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, it was a crush injury, you know, going back down in Brooklyn to, to his decline of his driveway, pulling right. down his, you know, this is before clickers on the, on the driveways were prevalent. But the long story is that he had a lot of time on his hands at that point. He was convalescing at home. He had just mm -hmm. been told that he was able to... Um, to see visitors and get around with his cane um mm -hmm. got his cast off he had a cast up to his hip oh wow so he had he had time on his hands i, I that's one of his favorite tunes by the way he loved playing it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but in any case i you know i didn't know him at all i just was kind of familiar with his playing i had to do a master's thesis at, at city college ccny mm -hmm. yeah for english english literature it turns out he was a, a, a literature guy i mean really really well read yeah. i mean like you know ridiculously well read could have been an english professor easily if he wanted to be sure. and uh led to 18 hours of interview there's so few um you know i've heard so many stories about how he was i've talked to everybody i can talk to that knows him yeah. I, we did read there was recently on earth like a a, a, sh a video interview but it's and it's really in bad quality it, it, yeah you got but, it from me yeah. yeah i'm sure i did yeah. i'm just wondering why and maybe you know or maybe you know just from having known him did he avoid interviews? Did he not want to be, you know, like, or did oh, just not? Hardly. I mean, if, if you go to my website, pepperadams.com, there's a whole bunch of radio interviews. This just turns sure. out to be the only. But film just not interview. TV. He didn't like to do a film or. No, just it had nothing to do with preference. I think okay. it just had to do with, you know, with just with serendipity. Just, Got I, it. I okay. mean, I, or they're just not, they're not kept for posterity. I mean, sure. he was okay. interviewed with Tete Montalio. Mm -hmm. and um and but they were translating and they didn't have that much to say this was in 1983 or so yeah um he was also just trying to think he might have i, I i'm still i'm still actively okay. trying to find as much video as i yeah, can yeah, yeah yeah i don't think there's anything to that other than okay um yeah i mean obviously we all know he doesn't have as much uh you know press or whatever it doesn't you know he's not quite all the accolades he maybe should given some of the other virtual sexualists but i was just wondering maybe the lack i know there are tons of interviews there's written interviews and other things i was just wondering yeah. why because it's i i bring that up because i want hearing him speak you can tell how intelligent and how oh, you know thoughtful oh, it's, he it's, is it's it's, it's a whole different thing incredible. yeah yeah and some of the yeah. interviews i've read in magazines like downbeat and i think maybe they changed the way he spoke it, it doesn't come off quite the same as when you actually hear him so correct it's sort of like a whitney balliet or however he pronounced right. his name uh to kind of try not trying to kind of imitate what he says but uh, right. they, it's correct yeah you're right about that for sure yeah i have a, a few questions just to start i mean just sure. in general i mean obviously so you put out the discography some years back and that yeah I know this that one in here right yeah my tone this was actually the last book that Dan Morgenstern wrote a preface for. Okay. And uh, so I was really happy about that. Um, he was, and you, he was, I, yeah, got it. I was going to say, and you've had so many other projects. I know you were involved in all the recordings and everything and, and all this other stuff. Yeah. So you're obviously, this is not, you know, people have written books on, on musicians and then moved on to do other things. You obviously, yeah. I mean, and you run the, the Pepper Adams website. I mean, I, and as far as I know, you're not a baritone saxophonist. That's not no, your, your training. No. Uh, no, training was classical guitar and Renaissance right. lute, but always so, really involved with jazz. So, and never, never the jazz makes sense, but I'm wondering why specifically, how did Pepper Adams get to be the, the singular focus? Yeah, well, I, I fortunately had a chance to meet him and admire mm -hmm. him, and he was a friend of mine. And then uh, I had this one experience, which I've written about, and it's I, I mentioned also in the book about a year after he passed away, I started interviewing musicians, and, and I had the good fortune of getting very friendly with Tommy Flanagan, but I was meeting him at the Regatta Bar where he was playing with his trio, the, the great trio with Mraz and Washington, Kenny Washington. And that was the first time I was meeting him. And of all, I can think of all the 250 interviews that I've done, that was the only time that I was unbelievably starstruck. I mean, sure. I, I was just a babbling idiot, really, because of, of his, of all that he had done and, and had uh, up to that point. But we got to know each other. And he told me that 
he was one of the very last people to see Pepper on, on when he was ill. Mm -hmm. um, four days before he passed away, and my manuscript was stacked high in his nightstand because I had about 200, 350 pages of transcript from the interview, the 18 mm -hmm. hours of interview that I did. And um, at that point, I had already realized that I was going to write a biography because mm -hmm. Pepper had gotten ill. He was struggling for his life. He wasn't really available yeah. to yeah. hang out except for a few times. And, and so um, it, it just didn't seem like he was he would have the mental wherewithal to even be involved in a co-written autobiography, sure. which was which what, what I was looking at as it like what it was looking like at the time. So in any way, um, uh, to answer your question, um, Flanagan told me that at one point he was he came out of his coma and he was mm -hmm. nudging the, the manuscript toward Flanagan. And that that image just overwhelmed me, you know, put tears in my eyes, really choked me up. It was at that point that I realized how important this was to Pepper. I mean, mm -hmm. this was next to his bed with his cigarettes, you know, which he stopped smoking after a while. Right. Um, and then as that kind of washed over me, I got a renewed vigor to get very involved in the project. This was mm -hmm. years before I decided to spend my personal wealth and do all those recordings. Right. But um, so I, I went on and, and interviewed about 250 musicians. Um, of course, I had the, the basis of my interviews with Pepper which hadn't been published except for some stuff in Cadence, but there was a lot that wasn't in Cadence. Some of it reached this, the uh, first Pepper book, mm -hmm. because I knew that some of that material would never see the light of day because it was just too specific. It was too arcane for a biography. Right. I was, I mean, the biography really was something that I wanted to have a broad reach and have a socioeconomic and cultural context. Mm -hmm. I wanted to explore Detroit. I, for years, I was trying to figure out what is it about these guys? You know, what made them so special? And I finally figured it out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, unfortunately I haven't delved in yet. I'm, I may be waiting for a paper copy. I'm going to try and get the ebook too and, and dive into it. Yeah. So I haven't, I don't, I don't have an idea yet of, of how it's laid out, but maybe you can tell us who's sure, watching sure. sort of how, how, is it a traditional biography where you go from the beginning to end? I, mean, no, I know you no, have no, a no. lot of links of recordings. So what, what is sort of the yeah, format of I this? I am so this glad you asked me that because I'm actually very proud of it. I, being an English major and being exposed to a lot of biography, mm -hmm. I didn't want to do the Rex to riches trope and I right. didn't want to do anything that was cliched, principally because I wanted something that was consistent with Pepper that, mm -hmm. that he would have liked for me to do. And that was one of the reasons why I didn't write it until about four years ago. But I just didn't think I was worthy or ready. Oh, so wow, okay. suddenly I came back after seeing Jason Marshall do this. Uh, we, he and I both did this internship for four, three days at Utah State University. And I just came back really charged up. I felt like finally I was ready. I had been groping with a first chapter for a very long time. And I finally heard this interview that I did with one of Pepper's friends from Detroit, Oliver Shear, this little known vibes, vibes player and singer who ultimately went to Juilliard. But he, at that time, he wasn't part of that advanced click of Detroit musicians. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he told of the story of he and Pepper and a, and a close friend of theirs, Bob Cornford, going to see Bird at the Mirror Ballroom in 1949 and Pepper's reaction to it. Mm. And that just struck me as the most perfect launching pad for the book. So yeah. I opened with that epiphany because Pepper really was groping for a style and that just shot him into one direction very quickly. Yeah. Um, so I start with that in the opening chapter. I, I should say that uh, I write a prologue before that about my relationship with Pepper, mm -hmm. only because not only do I want to get it off my chest, but I wanted to get me completely out of the way sure. In, in, sure. in a sense. And Chick Corea did write um, a forward to the book, which I'm really proud of. This was about a year before he passed away. Amazing. And so that said, um, yeah, so what I did is I, decided to do the book in two halves and it was, it was a decision that was organic and it really came about as i was working the book mm -hmm. because uh there, there's an author i can't forget his name this british author does a lot of comic books um who said uh writing of writing generally is like driving through the fog with one headlight out i mean you really don't know where you're going it's almost like a jazz solo you just mm -hmm. you, you know you're hoping for inspiration and you're hoping to sustain a story uh, so the first chapter uh, starts with with uh, Pepper in Detroit, 1949, as a 19-year-old. And then I just basically trace how he got to Detroit from Rochester, because he grew up in Rochester, New York. He was born in Detroit, but his parents split 
because of the depression. And then he rejoined when he was a four year old in Detroit. His, his father was from from Rochester. Mm -hmm. So in any case, um, so what I do is I trace Pepper from the mirror through his experience at Wayne University, now Wayne State University, as an undergraduate until he's drafted. Right. And then I step back in chapter two and I talk about his youth and his his uh, his genealogy, mm -hmm. his parents. His mother was from from Connemara, which is the rugged uh, coastal region of Ireland. He oh. thought he was 100 percent Irish. Turns out his father was Scottish and he was an indentured servant who was captured at the Battle of Dunbar. Oh, wow. In 1650. <laughs> March 20 years after the battle, battle by Cornwall's forces, incarcerated, sold to a middleman, and sent back to, to the New World as an indentured servant when he worked at the Saugus Ironworks for seven years, smashing metal and working the land. So it's an, really an incredible story. And I try to use that as sort of a leitmotif through the book of Pepper's determination to conquer that beastly horn that you play. Because in my view, he's the first really great soloist and virtuoso on the instrument for, in mm -hmm. jazz. I mean, he's really, really liberated the instrument. Yep. So, yeah, so that is the second chapter. I take that up to Pepper's time leaving for Detroit. And then the third chapter is completely about his time in the military, which he wouldn't talk about. He oh, wouldn't really? talk about his women, his personal relationships. He wouldn't talk about the military and a lot of servicemen are like that. They sure, just sure. They see a lot of horrific things. I mean, Pepper witnessed some guy blowing up, you know, just, who, who had a direct hit, oh, who was in arms. It was, uh, what, what do they call it? A, uh, carrying arms. He had a bandolier and he was carrying a box of ammo and he suffered a direct hit. He knew Teddy Lancaster, a drummer who Elvin really admired, Elvin Jones, who Pepper played with as a kid in Rochester. He, he died in the service. Uh, he was traveling. I could go on for weeks, by the way. So just, you know, just wave Change. if you want me to stop. Yeah, it's all great. But, um, no, it's great. Yeah, I've been doing this so long. But um, he wouldn't talk about this at all. So I fortunately had three people that were in the service with him that I was able to interview. And one person wow, that came wow. to really late, who was, who was in his platoon. So that whole chapter is, it's a shorter chapter because there's not a ton of information, but it's really interesting. That was during the time that Bird asked him to play a gig with him in Kansas City. And there's a story about that, about Bird yeah. not showing up and Pepper H hiking and, and uh, staying at the Y for two nights and then going back to the base. But that's really when Pepper became the player that he ultimately would become. And so in the military, he didn't, I, you know, some of my mentors, Junior Mance, talks about being in the military and then sort of uh, Cannibal Adderley sort of saved him and brought him into the band. He was able to play music. So Pepper was not playing in the military. He was just a full on soldier then, I take it. No, no, he was in the, he was draft. He decided to enlist so he could get in the, in the band. Okay. So, so he, he was playing okay. on base at the band. Um, Flanagan was there on base. Um, uh, Bill Evans was there for a time. You know, Bill oh, Evans was a flutist, by the way. Yeah, I yeah. did not know that. He started as a flutist and okay. he was a, a phenomenal one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the um, baritone player, I can't think of his name, Ron Colbert from Chicago told me that that is why he played in phrases because he, he started as a flutist. And so he was there. Um, Pepper was trying, like everybody else was, to avoid going to Korea, but he sure. was shipped off. Well, he, was, he, okay. spent, he spent six months in Korea playing for morale going right. from mass unit to mass unit and just, and, uh, and, that, and he was actually the music director there. And he came back on the ship and said, you know, uh, I thought I was preparing for a life outside of music, but my, my, my pedigree and my training in Detroit is so more advanced than the people that were in the band at the, at the base who were professional musicians who were 10 years older than me, that I think I'm just going to try to be a musician. Mm -hmm. And then he spent the my, chapter four is about the next three years or two and a half years that he spent in Detroit playing at the bluebird playing uh, at the West end hotel, playing at these incredible places. And what I do is I talk about that whole culture mm -hmm. and try and make sense out of it. He also was the apprentice of Curtis Fuller. A lot of people don't know that it's like the only know. person he ever taught hmm. and, and Curtis Fuller, as uh, I've quoted him, says, if it wasn't for Pepper, I would have never been the musician that I was.
Interesting. Um, so Pepper was very influential in the trombone lineage. So that's, do uh, you want to keep going? That's the, that's the first Yeah, I mean, where does it go book. from there? That's, that's yeah. an interesting, it's a different sort of different route. I like it, yeah. Yeah, so around, uh, you know, basically I was trying to do the book thematically rather mm -hmm. than chronologically. Then I decided, since I've already spilled the beans about my relationship with Adams and his death, because right. I start my prologue by saying, on my first wedding anniversary, my wife and I went to, to the memorial service of Pepper Adams. I didn't have to build to his death. So I decided to start the second chapter in reverse chronological fashion with his death and his final illness, because I have mm -hmm. all sorts of people talking about it. The, the late Denny Christensen, the band leader who Pepper recorded with, is actually the only recording Pepper ever did as a feature solist with a big band. He couldn't believe it when he actually researched it as, you know, as, as the whole recording, not just as a spot. Right. Um, and, um, and then I just worked my way back thematically because what I thought I would do is, and kind of terrace the book because it occurred to me, I have a, I'm not a co-author, but somebody I'm doing research with John Vanna, mm -hmm. an alto player who's doing a second vol. Uh, well, this would be a third volume, but a second volume of this study which is all musicological in nature. And he was originally going to do discuss all the recordings and I was just going to do the biography, but I realized here, my book's coming out in 2021. He's not going to be done until 2030, at which point is Pepper's oh, wow. centennial. And people are going to be really bugged if I don't discuss Pepper's recordings at all. It's, right. I've got to do it somehow. So I decided to just kind of work back chronologically and kind of terrace it so that I would do like, um, I, would, I talked about Pepper's, illness in his last few years and his last few recordings what he was able to achieve when he was sick mm -hmm. the whole nature of his illness and how it galvanized the new york city jazz community it was a really big deal actually that i witnessed because mm -hmm. people were very upset because they thought his wife left him and all this stuff um, right. so that i get i get that done then i talk about his female relationships later but i also right immediately chapter six i talk about his relationship with his wife how they met Mm -hmm. Then I talk about recordings after he left Thad and Mel. Then I talk about the history of, of, of not just Thad. I, I have a chapter called Conjuration because Pepper thought that Thad Jones was, was the ultimate musician in all yeah. ways. Yeah. You know, and conjuration means to conjure up a magical spell or magic. So I use, I use Pepper's titles, tune titles as chapter titles. Uh, so I, I wrote, I write one chapter specifically about the entire history of the, of Pepper's, Pepper and Thad's quintet, which has mm -hmm. never been written about. And mm -hmm. then I go into tremendous depth about the history of the band. And I, and then I talk about recordings and solos and solos I like. And of course I sprinkle every chapter with a ton of unissued material that no one's ever heard. So mm -hmm. there's about 200, 250 recordings that no one's heard. Um, so, and those links are in the book and I just worked my way back. I decided I would just uh, finally work my way back to a final chapter before my conclusion that would say, um, to get back Pepper back to New York. In other words, the, the book ends. So Pepper's going from, he's developing to, uh, in, in Detroit in the military, I call that, uh, ascent. Mm -hmm. And then he's working backwards in the second chapter which I call Dominion. And I basically wanted to get him back to the point where he got to New York to ask, did he achieve what he wanted to do when he first heard Charlie Parker in 1949 mm -hmm. to be the virtuoso of that instrument and basically play on an instrument with a virtuosity like pianists, right. like a Tatum. And so then I answer that. I answer that and what happened to him, why he is universally acclaimed by all everybody and yet didn't technically get the due that he received right and so i go into various reasons for that uh, yeah that's i mean that's something I've, I've thought about a lot especially i remember when i was younger i saw uh it was a dizzy gillespie big band performance oh, and they thank have you. jerry yeah. mulligan as the the guest star and i remember yeah, trotting pepper, out there. pepper in the section i'm like what does that feel like to be pepper adams and and not yeah, they didn't well, even you know really give him anything you know to do well there's a there's a lot there's a big story and i have that in my discography and mm -hmm. uh, you know there, um, uh, uh, curtis Fuller said what the f do you have to do mulligan with with dizzy right. and exactly. max wanted to punch mulligan out i mean it was very contentious it turns out that that was all showbiz 
Pepper I, actually yeah, did. Right. Pepper did have a solo, by the way, but they just yes, didn't include yes. it in the film. I've uh, heard Quinalma, that. Yeah. Right. And I talk about that, but I, you know, that's kind of stuff that was so specific to the discography. Yeah. But I have all this material that that baritone players and jazz fans yep. should bug out by. I mean, all this great material going back to Pepper's first recording as a clarinetist before wow. he even took the baritone with Flanagan, by the way, forty-seven. It's so interesting that. From my perspective, most modern baritone players really come more out of the Pepper Adams lineage. To me, the baritone kind of split at Mulligan and Pepper. Right. And I feel like most dedicated baritone players come out of the Pepper school and some of the non-dedicated ones come out of the Mulligan school. Not that there aren't baritone players who love Mulligan and whatnot. Um, and not but, to put either one down in any no, way. No, for me, yeah. they're very different. Yes. They're, um, well, it's as different as Hawkins and, and Perez, right. really. Yeah, but it's know? just interesting that even though he clearly has the dominant influence, Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you hear yeah. him playing more and everybody. He's not necessarily as well known. Like if you go to some young class of jazz musicians, you, ask, you say name a baritone player. They'll probably oh, Mulligan. name Mulligan. Yeah. Right. But well, it, that, yeah. that's something that I tackle in my conclusion. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of reasons for it. I don't want to spill the beans. Sure. No, I'm yeah. trying to promote the book. Absolutely. Of but I can say that one of the main reasons for that is because Pepper was always a side man. Mm -hmm. He was I mean, I should say not always because he did recordings as, on his own. Yeah. But he functioned for a very long time as a sideman, and he wasn't on the touring circuit really when he was considered a Barry player yep. in Thad's band. Once he finally liberated himself from Thad's band and went out on his own as a single, yep. his his entire life exploded. I mean, those six years from from September of seventy seven until he had the leg injury yep. were probably his most glorious time. He did half of his composing. He toured the world. Mm -hmm. He was nominated for four Grammys in six years. Two were his, his own recordings. I mean, it was just, a, he was on the Grammy Awards telecast. His life was really on the ascent until that accident. He, mm -hmm. he finally had management. And I, the, the, uh, the metaphor I use is like, like a sandcastle at high tide. His career just washed away slowly. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but Unlike uh, what James Lincoln Collier and some other musicians, uh, some other critics have said that musicians are like racehorses and they peak in their 30s, they make their best recordings, and then they're, that's it for them. Pepper was getting better and better and better yep. and better. And it's demonstrated in the recordings. I mean, yeah. even when he was deathly ill, he was doing incredible things. It might have been a slow motion because he didn't have the wind power he was sure. exhausted but it was just extraordinary but yeah so it's been an amazing amazing journey for me a personal journey i always wanted to to do something in jazz and make a difference i didn't know Absolutely. it was gonna be pepper adams hmm. um but i did get approval at city college to do a an oral history of a jazz musician and he's the guy that responded oh interesting and that's he's how the guy all... who okay. chose me and I did, I did go to grade school, seventh grade with Thad Jones' son, Bruce. Oh, okay. So, so when he found out that, it was like, I, we're, okay, very good. So when do you want to meet? Um, but it's been an amazing journey. And uh, um, I had I really wasn't ready to write a biography, as I mentioned, sure. until, until I felt more competent as a historian mm -hmm. and, and had more of a grasp of where I wanted to go with this thing. I knew I wanted to do thematic. A thematic approach, but I, I also wasn't sure how I was going to flesh this out. Yeah. And I just kind of intuited, you know, I finished that first chapter. So Pepper, Pepper's at the mirror. And then I talk about how he got to Detroit. His mother actually um, brought him to New York City because he, so he could apprentice with Skippy Williams, Albert Skippy Williams, who is uh, actually people, little, a little known tenor player, but who played in Duke's band during the recording band after yeah. Ben Webster left. So, so Pepper, that's, those were the lessons that Pepper had. He was mostly self-taught that way, mm -hmm. just hanging out with musicians. So, all right, so let's talk about what he did in New York. And he's hanging out with Bob Wilbur and Sidney Bechet. Bob Wilbur was a very close friend of his, kind of a mentor, only yeah. two or three years older than him, but a much more advanced player who went to Eastman for four months, one semester, and they befriended each other when Pepper was a kid. Mm -hmm. And then where do I go from there? All right, well, let's just talk about Detroit and take him to the army. And all right, now I got to go back and I talk about his parents. It fits there. And it just just kind of evolved, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a like a snowball, really. It's interesting that he started on clarinet and, and sort of had some start in, in uh, you know, the Rochester area. 
because yeah. the, the, actually now the Eastman School of Music has a very strong clarinet studio again. And it's actually yeah. known for his clarinet studio. Uh, yeah, Michael it was Wayne, clarinet. Who was in, yeah. It was clarinet and also soprano. And then he got right. to tenor. He started playing tenor when he was 13. Mm -hmm. wanted, wanted to play like, like Hawkins and Bias, which is no big surprise when you're right. playing. It's so interesting that he, you know, Bird was obviously the impetus for everything. I don't, when I hear a lot of people who of that age and heard Bird and changed, you know, did a 180, I you hear more of, a direct influence like i mean obviously he's playing bebop but it's it doesn't sound like bird it's it's his own language oh, he, he developed his he own his own thing it, but yeah. so he managed to take he heard the same thing everybody else did but did such a different unique thing not just the instrument obviously i mean the baritone is different but even what he's playing even if you put yeah. that on a different instrument it's so different i think yeah. people don't realize that not only was he doing something completely new on a new instrument he was doing a whole new kind of language too. Yeah, it uh, wasn't just playing bird on on the baritone. Right. People were playing pep, uh, bird's licks. He didn't want to do that. All, yeah, he, no, he really he essentially wanted to take that language. Mm -hmm. But Pepper was a very sophisticated listener. He had already spent many many years listening to classical music. Was very mm -hmm. influenced by it. Yeah. So bitonality, uh, substitutions, all that really cool stuff. Plus, he was a genius, a certifiable genius. Mm -hmm. So he had this vocabulary in his head where he could quote anything, it seemed, right. you know, from uh, university fight tunes to the entire vocabulary. Yeah. He loved old show tunes. He used to, um, uh, and Gilbert and Sullivan uh, operettas. I mean, he was really he knew the opera, all the mm -hmm. operas. Um, now Thad Jones's first wife was an opera singer. Oh, and okay. so, you know, he just was very, very, very erudite. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, that of the, of the modern young players who are mm -hmm. coming out of Pepper, and I just wanted to put a little plug in. On December 12th, I'm doing a panel discussion with 10 Barry players. Excellent. excellent. And also some non-Barry players who played with Pepper. So it's going to be about a two-hour panel discussion. We're going to start with the old, like the first, the first wave, of Pepper's peers. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be uh, Gary Smullyan, Glenn Wilson, uh, Kenny Berger, who is the only great. living sub for Pepper in the in the big band. Every time I and see also, Kenny, I ask him about Pepper and he yeah, tells me a new story. Yep. Yeah. And Larry Dixon, who also was in the Blue Wisp Orchestra and knew Pepper pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm going to do is take a, a, a 180 and I wanted to introduce people who played with Pepper who were not Barry players because he's too much. He's, he was an original player. Mm -hmm. but he's too often just associated with the Barry. Right. But as we just discussed, his vocabulary is so much different using the diminished scale and personalizing that, uh, his use of time, his time feel, just mm -hmm. you know, pulling back the time when he's stating phrases, like stating heads like a singer, but then just playing with incredible virtuosity and speed. Uh, just a very unique player. But he also had that humor that he got from Rex Stewart. He loved Rex Stewart, mm -hmm. just adored him. They just oblique, harmonics sensibility and sense of humor and the whole sense of humor thing could get really slapstick with that as you can hear on that thad and pepper date to when they right. play uh you know the tack piano with duke pearson um uh it's just you know and which horrified orin keith news but yes yeah, so the panel discussion is going to be those four people for about a half an hour uh -huh. and then it's going to be peter leach i've invited a bunch of other people i have john vanna too who i'm working with for his book mm -hmm. and uh, drummer andre white from canada who played with pepper when he was 19 drummer drummer and pianist up there in Montreal is at McGill mm -hmm. and uh, Frank Griffith, the arranger who's from Oregon, but now lives in Liverpool who wrote some charts mm -hmm. and then back to the modern Barry. So it's going to be Jason Marshall, Frank Basile, mm -hmm. uh, Adam Schroeder, Great. Anders Spano, Spano uh, who am I leaving out? Gosh, two other guys um, uh, who I'll think of, but um, uh, maybe Frank will be in there. No, Frank Basile will definitely be definitely in there. Okay. Um, yeah, so I said Adam Schroeder. Okay. Hold on for a minute, I'll tell you. Sure. Uh, but it's going to be great. It's going to. Uh, oh, and uh, Aaron Langton, who's hosting it. Oh, great. It. Yep. Excellent. Yeah. So he's actually hosting it. Um, and then there's somebody I'm forgetting. I do apologize. Somebody good. And um, uh, where can people check this out? Where will they I'm gonna. Be? I'll send you. I'll send you the announcement because what okay. we're gonna do is we're gonna tape it for YouTube so we can Great. post it at that point. Excellent. But we're also gonna take chat if people want to participate. Sure. Uh, but it's mostly gonna be that panel discussion. I'm just trying to promote this book. You know. Yeah. I mean, just I like mean, Pepper, <laughs> I feel like I'm languishing in the in the shadows. You know. What what are I so see? You've got this going. What are any other plans for the book? I mean, what. You know, you've spent so much time on this. Do you have uh, inklings of what what's next for it? 
Yeah, well, I, 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 uh, I took a little break from it once I decided that it was quote unquote finished and then okay. started reading it again, realized that I had to change some things. I realized there was a, a, a paragraph that was repeated. So I'm actually going to make some revisions before I send it out to reviewers. And I just okay. just hired a PR person to mm -hmm. and uh, to get the word out. So we're going to put sure. a campaign out for Great. the book. Uh, but at the po this point, the book is available on pepperadams.com. You'll see the picture on the on the homepage. Yep. Just click through it. It's twenty four ninety five. It's called Reflectory. People should know that's the title, right. which is also the name of one of Pepper's Adams. Has seems to be the, the theme with the chant uh, the. Uh, chapters right that's one of his yeah yeah uh, yeah picking his tunes it seemed like the only poetic uh, title that i could use for the book that kind of implied that i was looking back right at his life so it's reflectory the life of music of pepper adams yeah mm -hmm. you gotta, uh, I, I, the names of his tunes and his albums and generally everything he always picked great words like you know everything like all the oh, excellent yeah everything. You know, excellent excellent was uh something he picked up from james joyce Oh, That's on the Red Garland date, um, mm -hmm. a great tune of his. He liked, it, apparently, according to one of my interviewees, James Joyce liked to take two words at opposite poles and put them together into one word that really didn't exist, but he invented a word. So excerent was a combination of excellent and excrement. <laughs> Yes. And that's what that's what James Joyce did. Pepper like that, Excellent. but yeah, he had a lot of unusual titles. No question about it. Um, I'm sure you cover this, but in general, other, like outside of music, what 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 was Pepper into? What were what were his interests? What did he do when he wasn't playing music? I mean, you obviously smoking he was... cigarettes, smoking okay. cigarettes, uh, drinking um, scotch or bourbon, and mm -hmm. reading. So he was a voracious reader of English mm -hmm. literature. Um, and when he read somebody like Anthony Burgess or um, William Trevor or any of any any of the, the writers that we can mention of the 20th century, he read everything of theirs. He's a completist. Mm. Um, so um, satire, he read even as a kid, he was as a, as a 14 year old, he was reading The New Yorker and admired S.J. <laughs> Perlman mm. and, uh, you know, and Thurber, you know, the, the satirist in, in The New Yorker. Sure. He was a very, very brilliant guy. And, and uh, the more I delved into it, and the more I heard from my interviewees, the more I realized. I mean, yep. uh, the baritone player, Marvin Holiday, uh, Marv Holiday, mm -hmm. who now lives in, uh, I think he's about 80, uh, 94 years old now, he's living in Ecuador. He said that Pepper had the equivalent of a PhD in English literature, mm -hmm. in music. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the, uh, I can't even think of the other thing. Um, I don't know. I, he just, he just could have done any, he was a mathematical wizard, mm -hmm. never had any problem with math. It just, just came to him. Um, just no problem there. So it was just, it's just, it was, you know, you can't make somebody like this up because he was really a funny guy. He had a tremendously dry sense of humor. I have all these anecdotes of, stories that he did and antics that he did as a kid you know, uh, leading the blind best bond year not to the ladies room as she requested but to a phone booth you know she thought it was hilarious or or in you know first first row of um of uh, anthropology class uh flicking a pencil at the professor and hitting him in the chest i mean just stuff that's wild you know that because he seemed like he was pretty straight laced if you, if you look at him kind of sure. looked like a bank teller um, I did interview uh, Rollins, who told me this incredible story about uh, Miles inviting him to Birdland for, for a, a jam session. Hmm. Pepper wasn't known at all in town. He played Rollins' horn. See, Miles said, come on, just let him play. And, and Rollins was just blown away. Wow. And that was that was a typical, because because Rollins told me, I, looking at him, this guy can't play, because he looked like a bank teller. He looked right. like a you know, nerd, a, a bookworm. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have similar stories like that. And those kind of contradictions really intrigued me. You know, the, uh, the, the white guy who played like a black musician of his and time. A lot of times was one of few white guys in a band with mostly black musicians. I mean, right. I mean, he's a lot yeah. of recordings and things where he probably would have been one of very few. I mean, Yeah. And, and the fact that because of that, he was in the inner circle and it wasn't right. just because he was playing with Detroiters. He was playing with Monk and he was playing with Horace Silver and, right. and all of these cats because he was one of them. And I talk about that. Uh, one of the major themes in the book is race. Mm -hmm. um, how he was, how he was treated by the black musicians well in Detroit and, yeah. and virtually all of his friends were the black musicians, but the white musicians scored him because he wasn't playing like Mulligan. 
wasn't playing that light puffy style. Right. Um, he was, he was playing the bottom of the horn. He was playing with a, a full, he was playing with air, you know, had that, air, that yes. horn filled up at all times. Yes. And, um, and then what happened in New York and uh, reverse racism, black musicians that wouldn't hire him because of what was going on racially at the time. Mm -hmm. because you know, Bobby Timmons, his cohort, how they were trying to exert their, their, um, uh, they were just furious with the critics for deifying uh, Dave Brubeck, for example, at the expense sure, yeah. of, of, of Earl Hines and Monk and all the great musicians that weren't getting the press that they deserved, et cetera, et cetera. They were trying to come in and establish themselves. This mm -hmm. was before black nationalism happened in New York. And then, um, uh, God, I could talk about this for days, but but I did try to contextualize the book. Um, I had a chapter solely, a section of the they call it an interlude, really, solely about the Bohemian scene in New York and how Pepper fit in with it. Because right. oh yeah, art was the other thing that he was that he really admired. That was the third okay. leg of the stool because he his thing was when he went to cities, he would go to any museum in that city to check out the art scene. He was really really knowledgeable about art. So yeah, so um, so he was involved in that whole bohemian post World War II scene where where New York became the center of the world, much mm -hmm. like Paris did in the twenties, the art world, and you had the flowering of, of expressionists, you know, the, all those great painters and. And some of them were musicians as well. And they would congregate the whole scene at the five spot and the, right. the loft scene, these incredible loft scenes that, that was going on there. Um, so that was a really, really rich time. David Amram was a big part of the book talking about mm -hmm. he and Pepper going to these, these lofts and, and the, the effect that Pepper had on all these people. Yep. But yeah, he just, yeah, it's 37 years since I started this project and, right. um, and he's still not, uh, what he should be he really should be a household name so i figured yeah. a 400 page biography was what he was due plus a second volume to do the science sure. basically the musicology and mm -hmm. transcriptions to prove the points that we're making so that yeah. so ultimately the two volumes will be conjoined in, two, in 2030 if people people buy my book they can buy the second volume separately or if they're new they can buy the two together sure but right now it's an ebook and so everybody should know as part of the ebook you've included links to recording so it's like an almost interactive you know something i i will absolutely buy a paper copy when it comes out but i will also yeah, thank you. <laughs> check out thank the ebook because i think having you know when you reading a biography about a musician without having the music is almost kind of silly. So I think having right. the music and, there. And why, uh, why send them to YouTube and lose the momentum right. that you have? It's so great with an ebook that you yep. can read about. I'm, I'm talking about, like, for example, the history of the Bird Adams Quintet right. with, with or without Herbie, you know, and it was, it was pretty intermittent until the last two years of that, of that yeah. run. It was basically 59, late 58 to late 61. Herbie joined uh, about halfway through after Duke Pearson decided to leave and, and go back to Atlanta and, mm -hmm. and woo another chick because that was his thing. I mean, look at his tune titles, yeah, heavy legs, you get a sense of that. Yep. Um, but but that's that's legendary. And I talk about that a little bit in the book. I mean, Thad was very much like that too, in, in some yeah. sense, he was a ladies man too. But that said, um, you t you, you're reading about the history of the band and and I'm talking about all my favorite tunes which mm -hmm. actually is every tune they ever did, frankly, that sure. Pepper soloed on because he's yeah. so great. And then you can hit the links and listen to him. You can listen right. to him as you read the book. So That's I tried great. to also, um, when I'm talking about Pepper's re important recordings, his, his two muse recordings, Reflectory and the Master, mm -hmm. and some of the other things that I think are, are really important recordings. It was, I try to go into greater depth. Yeah, there, I see that. Yeah. I try to go into greater depth. I talk a lot about ephemera. Mm -hmm. which I, I think is one of his greatest recordings. You know, he it's only another did. title I really like, the word ephemera. Yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. He only did three dates as a, in, in a quartet setting. He right. liked the quartet or quintet setting and played with how many great trumpet players from Lee Morgan, you know, through uh, in yeah. that kind of format, that particularly. Um, so I tried to... Um, I try to hit all those bases. I know Frank Basile was one of my readers and he said, you, you know, I got to almost the end. He says, you are going to talk about the... the uh, the quintet with Donald Bird, right? He thought maybe I wasn't going to talk about that part. I said, yeah, man, that's <laughs> just going to be the last chapter. Yeah, you can't leave that out. Yeah. Working my way back, Absolutely. you know? That's great. Uh, and one one personal question. What what area of Brooklyn did, did he live in? Canarsie. Oh, wow. 
8715 okay. Avenue B. Wow. So it's very, cl very close to Remsen. Yeah, that's out there. Yeah. And that, I talk about that being out there. And, and <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of my lead talking heads, my interviewees, was Albert Goldman, the biographer, was an English professor at Columbia, who later went on to do a book about Lenny Bruce, Elvis mm -hmm. Presley, and John Lennon. Pretty controversial figure, but a brilliant man who knew Pepper Adams really, really well. And uh, it's, it's, as an in, incidentally, tried to produce 20 years before Joe Henderson an all Strayhorn Pepper Adams date uh. and, and independently because Pepper was, I mean, another theme in this book is Ellington, Ellington and Strayhorn. I mean, because Pepper was yes. really, I mean, him and Mingus, man, they were so into Ellington. You know, that's, that's, whoops, that's one of the reasons they, they were very close. I recently got to play a, a, a set of all ballads. We played Star Cross Lovers, and I, I just uh, lifted I lifted the arrangement that he does with oh with, with that the, arch note that he plays yeah for I just, like four bars I oh, just yeah. took the whole and the counter line that he has the tenor play yeah it's like oh, yeah. Right, this is great I'm gonna just yeah do I, yeah yeah Encounter was another one that I spent yeah. a lot of time talking about uh, Smolian told me that that's what turned him around. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the pepper solos and the arrangements on that that record. So I appreciate the diversity, like in Ellington, but also he plays a, a Joe Henderson tune, which I heard for years, and then I heard the I was into Pepper before I was into Joe Henderson, and then I yeah. heard the, the original, and I was like, oh wow, that's it, when he plays Serenity, and it's just yeah. It's like, uh, he and takes uh, it and what was the other one? Punjab, right. Punjab as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Frank Basile told me that he felt that Zeus Sims was so out of place in that record, and you really? always wonder why. Henderson wasn't on that date, you know. Oh, well, sure, that would have been amazing too. Yeah, that would have been amazing. Pepper and Zoot are very close friends, for, okay. And they, okay. they used to get together in the village where they lived and they used to push back the furniture and pull out a ping pong table and play and drink. <laughs> and um, so I, I almost think that probably he, he got Zoot on the date before he even knew that Joe was available okay. because Joe is available on, on Thanksgiving weekend where they both ran down the, Joe's tunes together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess kind of did a dry run of the tenor Barry mixture so that he could get some more ideas about the, uh, the recording date that he was going to do about two weeks later. Mm. Um, that, that date is just phenomenal, you know, and just pepper the, the as uh, you know, I, I sent my, sent my first book to Bob Blumenthal, the great writer up in Boston. And he said, after he got my, my discography, I'm talking about the discography, he just went on mm -hmm. Pepper Adams Jones and he just listened all the way through. And the thing he remarked was just the uniform brilliance and quality of his playing, you know, just to such a high level. That was always the thing about Pepper as a sideman that people could rely on him to come in and play a, play a great section part. Mm -hmm. If he was called on for a solo, he would be, you know, commanding. Uh, Bob Cranch, I said, man, when in the Duke Pearson Big Band, and I, I do have a, a chat, a section about just about the Duke Pearson Big Band, another part of Pepper's um, legacy. He was one of the founding members of that band. He said, man, when Pepper, when Pepper got, when it was time for Pepper's solo. That's when we got hot. That's when we started dealing. He said, it was like playing behind Rollins. And as we know, Cranch played behind Rollins a long time. Yep. Many different stints. He said, that's, that's when we really started to move. That, that was a great band, you know? Not much recording there, but sure. um, you picked a few things. That's great. This is all great info, and I, I can't wait to dive into myself to the book. Yeah, and, uh, I'm I'm hoping everybody else will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For the Barry players who are listening to this, I have invited all the instrumentalists to bring their their instrument because great. if they wanted if they want to demonstrate something, because mm -hmm. I gave them three questions to answer. One was how did Pepper influence you. Mm -hmm. And what and why are we celebrating him here today? So I'm sure some of them will say, "Well, because he played." Right. Let them do that. You know, I want that. I want it to be interactive, and that'd yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. So I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you that announcement. Okay. And uh, I thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the book. Thank um, you for was, writing the book and being so, uh, such a such a presence for Pepper Adams for so many years. I mean, that yeah. that site you has been up as long as I can remember, and I've been going constantly to check out stuff there's always I, I have not you know exhausted it i have not seen every single thing there's so much stuff on there but i will oh, on, on you mean on the website yeah the there's so oh, there's much. Two, 
We have his lead sheets in a hidden place, by the way. So if anybody wants to know where they are, I can yeah. tell them. I've seen Gary showed me some of his lead sheets. It's amazing yeah. to see the the, the way in his hand. Out. Yeah, it's, yeah. Because the, just just lastly, I had the good fortune because I was working with Pepper of having his widow allow me to go through his materials. Interesting. At, just after he passed away, I mm -hmm. mean, everything was going into the dumpster, and I would say to everybody listening. If you have any interest in writing a book about any musician, any jazz musician or otherwise, mm -hmm. if they're going to if they do pass away, it's crucial that you put yourself in a position where you can get in there quickly before sure. stuff gets disposed. All that stuff was going to get chucked. So I got Peppers. I got one of his uh, his, what, his copy of two, two is one. The dedication that the Fed did for Pepper in the honor of his, of his marriage in 1976. Mm -hmm. um, I have a section of Amram's triple concerto. I have all the, I, I posted some of this stuff on my Instagram page, which you mm -hmm. can find on the website, but um, all the lead sheets, a ton of photographs, you know, everything on my Instagram page is, yep. I say, I'd say 90% of it are documents from his archive, Amazing. which I've been, I've passed on to William Patterson, by the way. So Great. people who want to see his stuff can go to William Patterson. Excellent. There's another whole half of the stuff that has not been delivered yet, principally because of COVID and the fact that I moved west mm -hmm. and had to leave it with my sister-in-law and it hasn't yet been picked up. And um, is there's something at Wayne State University, I think I remember, or... Not regarding Peppers. It's not, not, okay. I, I but he is, I he's not an alum. He went there for two and a half okay. semesters. I just um, maybe remember there's, or maybe there's a professor there that was putting together something in regards to Pepper. But Could have been related to the festival. Chris yeah, Collins. Been, yeah. Because he's, yeah. he's very, very much involved with that festival. Okay. Uh, that's a great festival, by the way. Yeah. No, and I'm so glad uh, William Patterson sounds like a great place for to keep some of this stuff. And yeah, I'm glad you were able to rescue a lot of it. I, I, uh, I studied with Danny Bank just before he passed away and he had, I interviewed him he had so many um filing cabinets of music and yeah I think yeah, his, yeah, yeah. you know he told me his sister was just going to come throw it out and I bet that's what happened um exactly and he had all this stuff and we don't I don't and, know what happened to his horns and, I don't know what you know yeah I uh his pepper's widow gave me his horn to give to Rutgers so I took it away when I was there that one day cleaning it out I rented a car because I was living on the upper west side yeah just loaded the trunk and loaded the back seat with stuff but I also found about 250 cassettes you know, of, of stuff that he was keeping. And I and and also found the recording that he did as a kid with Flanagan on on well, actually, no, I got I take that back. I got that from his friend Bob Cornfoot. But I did find this great recording, which is in the book, of, of seven or eight tunes he did for Vitaphone when he was on leave from the army. And he used the pseudonym U N Owen. Because he was still in the union, didn't want to get dinged for that. <laughs> and, and, and it's a recording with with the legendary pianist, Detroit pianist Boo Boo Turner, Otis Boo Boo Turner. So yeah. very much like Barry at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's this, and you hear Pepper at, at 22 years of age. And if it wasn't for the trumper screwing trumpet player screwing everything up, it would have been a viable release, and the world would have heard about Pepper three years earlier. Mm -hmm. As as it stood, we had to wait until Jazz Men Detroit with. Um, on Savoy to really hear what Pepper and his com compadres could do. Great. Um, but Pepper sounds great. Just sounds great on Barrett's own. Can't wait so to check young. it out. And yeah, I can't wait for everybody to check it out. So yeah, I think uh, I'll wrap it up there. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure I'll you know, send you some more questions. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this as, as uh, you uh, do more things about it. So please, please keep me and everybody informed. This is such a service. I'm not sure everybody will realize that you're doing this not as a well, obviously not a money-making thing because it's jazz, but also just this is a, because you think it's important. It's not the well, commercial he was, he was enterprise. A, it's a labor of love, and he was a yep. friend of mine. And, and I and told that, that Flanagan story. That that propelled me. to As that, a jazz that musician, that's what we do, yeah. right? So I appreciate yeah. that. That's yeah. incredible. I mean, that, that just, know. that became my purpose. Great. You know, it, gave, it, gave me, it gave me a foundation in my life. 